Uh, we've got a fantastic panel uh, to discuss our next topic, which is really a progression from where James uh, finished off. So the theme we're going to be exploring is accelerating health equity amongst First Nations communities. Now, our, our speakers have got extensive biographies, uh, very long biographies. We could spend 50 minutes reading uh, their achievements. So I plan not to do that. I ask you to look at those in your programs. But what I will be doing is asking when our speakers have settled into their chair that they each introduce themselves and, and give a bit of a background. So in order of our seating plan here, I would like to uh, bring forward, it's gonna be out of order from here, uh, Professor Yvette Rove, who's the co-director of the Molly Wadaguga Research Center at the Charles Darwin University. Yvette, please come on up. Uh, and uh, Professor Chelsea Watergo, who's the executive director of the Karumba Institute at the Queensland University of Technology. Chelsea, welcome. Uh, Mr. Greg Pratt. Oh, well, we've got Cleveland Fagan sitting with So Cleveland, please come on up. Uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Queensland Aboriginal Health Island Islander Health Council, Quake. And Mr. Greg Pratt, uh, Principal Research Fellow at the Central Queensland University. So please come and sit with us. I'm just going to uh, hold this. So as, as promised, uh, rather than me give um, extensive introductions, I would like to ask each of our panellists just to give an overview of your um, roles and your experience in the area so that we can uh, then start our discussion. So Yvette, I'll start with you. I thought you were going to go by grey hair, so that would be Greg. Okay. But, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to acknowledge the one, the sovereign lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people. Um, I've uh, lived here for seven years and it's been uh, in out of respect and acknowledgement of the ancestors past, present and the young people emerging to really uh, show recognition to that and recognition of my colleagues on the panel here. Congratulations on that talk, James. It really, I think, set it up for a, a robust conversation. I am a Nyingana Yarra woman from the West Kimberley. My father is a saltwater man from uh, Rubibi or Broome, and my mother is a freshwater woman from uh, Mount Anderson stations from saltwater. And to land in research, it's a really interesting thing because I, I was going to be a vet, so I was going to be a psychiatrist, I was going to uh, join the army, do a whole range of things. But when I think about my path into research, I actually look at the combining of saltwater and freshwater and how it comes together to make brackish water, where you get the most organic flourishing environments, where you get the wetlands, where you get mangroves and things like that. So, and also I'm, I'm the youngest of eight, so I'm quite argumentative. So being a researcher was sort of a, a natural thing to me. Um, and research has got a very deliberate role in my life, which is for me, I can't sing, I can't write poetry, I can't dance, I can't do a lot of things. So for me, research is my activism. And I have a deliberate focus that if my research doesn't make a difference to the communities that I'm working with, I need to go do something else. So it's a very political statement because the personal is very political. This is not about me getting career or about how many grants I get. When I think about the number story, I'm talking about a community, I'm talking about families, I'm talking about people who have lost people, people who have aspirations. When I talk about the, the, the heart story, the qualitative story, people have entrusted me to do something with that story. So again, research is a political statement, it's a political action, and we need to think ourselves as researchers about that pointy end of changing things. So uh, that sort of sets me up who I am. Thanks, Yvette. Yeah. Chelsea. Yeah, my name's Chelsea Wadigo. I'm a Manandali and South Sea Islander woman uh, for the Wadigo Williams and Slocky families, and fortunate to be born and raised on Yuggera country. Um, I um, Yeah, I had no aspirations to be a researcher, uh, if I'm honest. Um, I started out as an Aboriginal health worker, hospital liaison officer, um, working in sort of urban and rural contexts in primary and tertiary care. And, uh, you know, I was trained to uh, assess, surveil, control black bodies and behaviours, blood sugar levels, you know, uh, blood pressure, and um, also, you know, rolling out the, the mandatory cultural awareness training to teach the health system about our culture in order to improve our health and being on the lowest rung of the racial hierarchy and or the lowest rung of the health systems hierarchy, I became fascinated about power and um, it led me um, to interrogate the way in which power operates, particularly via public health upon the lives of black fellas, um, uh, how public health has been an apparatus of colonial control. Um, you don't have to look too far back in our history to see how that's played out for us. Um, 
And so I came to research to understand how power works in order to undermine it, to affect change. And I've always been fascinated by the fact that in health and in Indigenous health, we talk so much about racialized health inequality, but we don't talk about race. Um, and I talk, I, I, and when I say that, it's about race as a structure of power, not as an epidemiological variable. And so there's a kind of been an emerging interest in racism, um, and we've only seen that in the in the last of my career and the work of Ian Paradis, who shifted health researchers from saying the R word to saying racism, and that's in just in the brief time that I've worked as a health researcher. Um, and so I'm. Uh, interested in that space and I've shifted my strategy from appealing to the system through education um, to care for us to working in the space of health justice and holding the system accountable and working with families directly who have lost loved ones through a failure of the health system to care, not just in custody but presenting at emergency rooms. And, um, yeah, my work certainly is framed as very political and rarely intellectual. Um, so my best work as a researcher sits in a community organisation in Anala that I call home, Anala Wongra, um, and in the Institute for Collaborative Race Research, um, which is a private race research institute, we had to build to do the work because the academic institutions that I worked in would not allow for it to happen. And it's not work that gets funded by NHMRC. It's work that is a labour of love um, that we do in spite of the system's refusal to really grapple with uh, institutional racism um, and look at itself and its role as a perpetrator of racial violence in this place. Chelsea, thank That's you. Greg. Uh, yep. Uh, so I'll introduce myself first. I'm a Kwanda man, descendant of the Nunakal tribe, specifically the Brown family of Stradbroke Island and Jeriba. Um, but I had the the uh, privilege to grow up in Laura, which is in the Cape, uh, with the Kuku Yalaji and the Kuku Taipan people. Uh, and so from, from that, I went to high school, obviously. Um, I had to travel all the way down. I remember on the back of a ute, um, all the way from Laura for five hours um, to Cairns to go to boarding school in, in Cairns and subsequently, you know, enjoying high school and deciding I wanted to go to university and going to the University of Southern Queensland and actually studying psychology, uh, graduating in that space and working in mental health for approximately the next 15 years in uh, clinical capacity in both uh, the public hospital and health service and also in the uh, community control health service sector as well. So I've, I've spent time in, uh, in Cairns at uh, Wood Chopron. Uh, one of our um, community control health services for the state. Um, I won't steal your thunder. You can which way talk about that. Um, but uh, and uh, now I think over the last uh, ten to fifteen years, I've I've spent some time working in research, working in policy, uh, and uh, working in re uh, research as well, uh, policy and community control. But um, I landed in, I guess. Uh, QIMR. So I've been at QIMR, had the honour to work with David and our colleagues at the Queensland Institute of Medical Research for about the last 12 years, uh, really supporting the Queensland Institute of Medical Research to think about its responsibility, its obligation, its commitment to research that makes a difference for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, and health. And uh, really with an institute, the size and the responsibilities that it has, it's been a, a very um, a privileged journey that I've been on. Uh, 12 years there, and uh, I had the opportunity now to join Central Queensland University as a principal research fellow. So my area of work has mainly been in the mental health space, uh, also in what I would consider to be an equity space, more recently in the genomic space and making sure that our people have equitable access to health care, um, one word, and health care, two words, services, and then also equitable access to health research. So, and I think that's an important part of a conversation that we oftentimes miss. We think about the services that we provide and availing people with equitable access to those health healthcare services. But I'm imagining a large number of the people in the room and joining us online today are thinking about or involved in research. And we need to realize that promise of equitable access to health research as well. And that's a responsibility and an obligation that I would say to the community and the research community of Australia and internationally, we need to stand up and uh, and uh, take a, a, a position on. Thanks, Greg. And Cleveland. Uh, is it working? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, good morning. I'd like to just acknowledge traditional owners and where we are now and also acknowledge the people who are sitting on the couch with us. Um, I'm not a researcher. Um, I don't know sort of how I got here, but I'm glad that I'm here to talk about health equity. Um, my, my wife's a researcher. She works with Greg. Um, she's an epidemiologist. She's now started to do a PhD. And we have always had arguments around research and its role. Um, she's slowly starting to win me over now. So I'm starting to understand a lot better around the importance of research. My, my background is uh, my mob's from up north, Cairns. The mother's from Jabagai, Kranda. Um, father's side from Yurikanji, um, Cairns, and also Umpala up in Cape York. And my journey to get to where I am now started in the area of land. So I worked in native title, um, natural resources, land management, and then got into health because health gave me a job. Um, and since then, I've been in community control, um, been in Commonwealth Health in Canberra, state health here, and now back working here for um, for Quake, which is the state pick for all community control health organisations in Queensland. Um, my journey started in in um, in health in Wuchopran, on the board there, working there, and then I ran a Punapima Health Council for about twelve years um, to actually get healthcare um, in the control of community hands. And from there, I then started working in Yarraba around the Yarraba Leadership Forum, which was a form of empowerment for community people to come together to talk about social issues. And that idea started around a campfire out on our property, out, out of the mission, where we started to look at whether or not the community had the systems and processes to look after us as we started to get a lot older. Seeing that it didn't, the choices we had was we either could wait until someone did something or we could stand up and actually take control ourselves. And so going back from 2013 right through to where we are now, um, great inroads. And it's made me realise that, like James said, you know, unless we deal with social issues, we're not going to be able to maximise the health outcomes in the health space or even, you know, ensure that we've got equity for all of our mob across Australia. Um, then coming down into work for Quake here at a state level has made me realise that a lot more work needs to be done at a state and a national level to get the right environments to be able to enable mob on the ground to be able to do the things they need to do. And so that's where, you know, the health equity part comes into it for me. Thank you. So uh, you've now been introduced to our speakers. You can see that they have a, a wealth of experience, uh, both on the ground and in the research base. I would say that this session is open for people to raise their hands and ask questions. We do have roving mics, um, but I also have some uh, Dorothy Dixes, I guess, or prepared questions, but we're going to just uh, run off script quite often. And I'm going to ask my panelists to, uh, to be vocal and chip in. Um, so maybe just to get the ball rolling, um, we use the term health equity a lot, uh, but it can mean different things to different people. And we've heard today from James that maybe even equity is not our target. Maybe it's liberation. So, but first of all, I might just ask you, Cleveland, in your role as uh, CEO of Quake, you've done a lot of work with the monolithic Queensland Health Organisation about embedding equity frameworks in these big organisations. So can you give us... Um, please, just a, a brief overview of what we mean or what governments mean when they're searching for health equity. What does it look like? The, the health equity process, um, I led um, all of the consultations around Queensland with Queensland Health staff. And we did that, I think, in 2020 um, for over nine months. And the whole intent of that came out of some work that was done with Quake and also the Anti-Discrimination Commission around looking at the state of the hospital and health services across Queensland and measuring against the audit report that was developed by Henrietta and Adrian Murray um, around um, institutional racism. And what it identified was that um, all of the health, hospital health services were either high or very high in terms of um, institutional racism, which meant that a lot of our mob weren't actually accessing those services for the care that they needed in that secondary phase. And so what it allowed me to do was actually go and, and visit mob across Queensland to actually 
hear their voices and what they wanted to say, and they'd ensure that government was then listening to what community mob, mob had been saying and the reasons why they're not accessing. And so the intent of health equity, which is about acknowledging and recognising that to get health outcomes, people start from very different levels. Um, if you look at, for example, my own personal journey, um, up until I was eight years old, I lived in a shed with dirt floors, with my grandparents, 12 other cousins, um, cooking over a fire and having a bath in the river. And that was only when I was eight, up until I was eight years old. So our journey started from whole different levels to my friends in Cairns, you know, who had parents that were pharmacists and, nurse, and nurses and doctors and accountants. So for me to get to the same level of health care or education meant that I have had to travel a whole lot further. And so the health equity was around how do we get Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people into positions in the system where their voices and the journeys that disadvantaged people needs to travel are actually heard um, and acted on. The other key thing around health equity was, and it was bedded in legislation, was that we need to get people into um, the, the boards and we need to get increased workforce and we need to ensure that government was doing things differently, not the old you know, way that they've done things for the past 20, 30 years and hoping for a miracle and a change. But it was thinking really um, specifically around how they could get health outcomes for Aboriginal people. And that was to be done in partnership with Aboriginal Islander people, communities, traditional owners, organisations, and that was legislated in changes to the hospital, um, the hospital and um, health and hospital acts. The other thing also about it was that they would actually start to um, work with key stakeholders around accountability. You know, we have a lot of money going into Aboriginal health, yet we don't know who it's going to, what they're doing or what's being achieved. So the accountability under health equity was also very important because if organisations outside of community were getting money, we wanted to make sure that it was being delivered in a, an appropriate um, effective and culturally safe way. And the last thing then is that it would be then be documented in, in a plan that the HHS would then be required to provide back to Queensland Health and the Minister. Um, and that was to be bedded then within the um, performance measures then for the, the chairs and the and the CEs of the HHS. Some parts of Queensland is working really well. Like right at this time now, over the next two days, you've got IUI you know, having a health equity workshop at the convention centre, talking about how they're working closely with, you know, the big four HHSs and the PHNs down in South East Queensland. That's not happening across other parts of Queensland. And so our challenge is how do we ensure health equity is actually being taken seriously across Queensland, that it's being delivered in a right way and that it can demonstrate how it's getting the health outcomes we need for our people. Thanks, Cleveland. Now, I, I want to um, explore both practical uh, examples of health equity that's worked, but I also want to talk about some of the concepts that sit behind it. So maybe if I start with the concepts, and maybe I might throw this one at Chelsea uh, to start with, but there's a school of thought that um, the health system itself is part of the problem. It's not actually the solution um, because of history and, and um, settler colonialism and things like that. Would you be able to unpack some of those ideas for this audience and then we can move forward maybe to try and work out, well, how do we go forwards from here? Sure, I'll give it a go. Um, look, I find it interesting in um, sort of health and medical sciences, um, just the ahistorical take uh, that we find ourselves in and an inability to understand how health has operated in this place as an agent of the state. Um, black fellas know it. Um, we know it too well. We know, you know, the... Chief Medical Officer was also the Chief Protector of Aborigines. Um, we know that health has acted as a, an apparatus of control. It's not been benevolent and innocent. Um, and we've seen the emergence of interest in Indigenous health only come sort of really in the 90s, maybe a bit in the 70s. Um, but before then, there was a whole lot of silence and the interest in um, health where Indigenous peoples lived was for the interests of the settlers to be able to live in those conditions. Um, and that's not me making it up or being political, that's just the the reality of things. So, you know, I'd encourage you to read the work of David Thomas and Warwick Anderson 
white men tell you, listen, um, you know, they research this. It's not a, not us making it up. So this is where you're saying like the public health officers in communities were actually controlling those communities? Or... Absolutely. I mean, under the Act to get off the mission, you had to do the clean bill of health. There was the regulation and control of the lives of black fellas via health. Um, so it hasn't been this innocent kind of institution. Um, and I guess that's I'm, I'm kind of not in the decolonizing space. Um, I take an anti-colonial stance, I think, because if you think about colonization and looking at settler colonialism specifically, it's fine for other places in which colonization, where the colonizers come, extract the resources and return home. Those countries, they talk about decolonization. In a settler colonial state, where the settlers come to stay and take over and erase Indigenous sovereignty to replace, then we can't decolonize in that context from my perspective, um, but we can be anti-colonial. Um, so some of the things we're talking about are the same, but there's a different framing. We've taken up decolonization as it's talked about elsewhere without understanding the unique structure here. Um, but I'm also not team health equity either. And it's not that I'm against the idea of, I think, you know, we want the same outcome, but equity as the paradigm from which we work on, I find really challenging. Uh, and for a host of reasons, um, if we think about race and the racialized logics and how they work, we look at health equity and those graphs and the comparators. Who is assumed as the marker of wellness? Every time, whiteness is the standard of wellness of which we must aspire to. And we only look at those when whiteness is wellness. And if we operated differently, we might have different kinds of graphs to tell a different kind of story about who we are as a people and what health and wellness means. Um, but if I can appeal to the evidence base, if we look at Close the Gap, the health equity framework, we've had over 15 years of failed policy, yet we refresh it. We don't radically reframe it. So if evidence base is what we're working on, why haven't we changed that approach? Um, so I'm interested really in how we think about sovereignty as the framework in which we operate. And you know, the key example of evidence base is the COVID response, that communities acted in spite of the state. And you know, the racism that Indigenous health pr practitioners experienced in their communities in protecting their communities um, has yet to be talked about. And Queensland Health has silenced a whole lot of health professionals who want to tell the story about what they did in spite of the system to protect their communities. And so the health system claims the success, but that success has come because of the efforts of Indigenous peoples exercising their sovereignty. Um, the other thing I, I struggle with the current health equity uh, moment, and I think you know it's great the push in Queensland Health around the health equity framework and that that process and that consultation. My issue was with how the state then strategizes what the response is to it. And if you look at the health equity strategies across the health service districts here in Queensland, where K the KPI is eliminating institutional racism. You look at the strategies that each health service has devised in response to, and it's not institutional racism. It is how do we improve our complaint process for racism, rendering racism something that's interpersonal as an encounter, not as structural, not looking at dismantling systems and practices. Um, I'd love to do an analysis of the health worker workforce in terms of work cover claims and um, those who have left the workforce because the stories are, are coming out thick and fast of you know, senior Indigenous health pr professionals and managers who are experiencing the violence of the health system in this health e equity moment where the state's claiming that it's wanting to eliminate institutional racism. So can I just um, ask you there, when you use the language violence, what do you mean? Or how is that expressed? Are you talking physical or are you talking other aspects? In every possible of, way. Yeah. Um, physical, psychological, um, you know, and... It's in the, in the mundane, in the everydayness of it all, um, in the denial of access to resources like the CAF or the Aboriginal health worker who works in a community, um, to the surveilling of the whereabouts of a health worker who is working in their community, um, to disciplining people for being 10 minutes late back from their diary appointment because they were servicing a family who's on sorry business. There's all these kinds of things that are happening in our health system for those who are working tirelessly in it. Um, you only have to look at the health worker career structure in Queensland Health. That's a form of violence in and of itself. And the, the, the state continues to focus on the competency of Aboriginal health workers and has not fixed that issue. And we've heard from health workers for over 20 years. Um, and uh, I had a degree in uh, Indigenous primary health care from the University of Queensland. And I was a 003 Aboriginal health worker. Um, the person who cleaned my office got paid more than me. Um, and that was 20 years ago and little has changed. 
Um, so there's all forms of violence. And I, and I use the term violence explicitly to contest the benevolence and, and innocence that the state claims via health. Um, and it, it is a deliberate um, device to name it for what it is because we talk about cultural safety and there's a presumption that the state is committed to the safety of Indigenous peoples. And that's not the case. Um, it's not what we're hearing from Indigenous health professionals. You know, even that what happened with our first Indigenous ophthalmologist and his treatment when he dared break the silence about racism in, the, in, in, the, in his college and in his training, yeah. um, the backlash that he received on that. So even when you make it to those great heights and become as good as, you know, achieve the equity marker, you still experience racial violence. And there is a commitment to silence around it. Um, our example from the MJA special issue on Indigenous health, where I was asked to do a guest editorial on racism and the health system. And when we told the story and presented the evidence base, it was um, excluded despite passing peer review. So there is a commitment in this place to not dealing with racial violence. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, <laughs> are there any questions from the audience? Just do, do send them down if you need to, just raise your hand if I'm, I'm looking in your direction. Um, I know that uh, Greg and Yvette have done lots of, uh, all of the panel, but, but more recently uh, doing a lot of on the ground um, interventions uh, to try and improve equity. Maybe Yvette, you could share some of your experience about things that work where you've seen small programs make a difference. So I really, uh, you know, again, echoing the comments of, of Chelsea and Cleveland about the violence that's imposed on our community and, but who gets blamed for it? We do. You mob don't really care about if you really thought about this, if you did that, that, if you complied to the system. So we get blamed for the system that brutalises us every day. So, so when, you, when you talk about accountability, who's accountable for what? Um, so I actually move away from the word intervention. So I, I, live, I was born and raised on Larrakia country and um, moved to, around the place and have recently gone back. So for 12 years, the NT had the NT intervention because, you know, uh, and we, we changed the, the uh, Racial Discrimination Act because we needed to control these people because they couldn't look after themselves. And it, it was horrific outcomes. There was billions of dollars spent in there. <clears throat> And so I really move away from that. And I think, so again, it's about reclaiming the narrative. What are we trying to do? We're trying to put a suite of strength building activities defined by community to support them to uplift, flourish, and actually hit their aspirations. So when I think of an intervention, people use a thing, what do you want, Chelsea? I'm intervening on you because you're the problem. But when I reframe it, it's about what are the strength things that you guys need that I've heard really clearly? And it's not the consultation because black fellas are tired of that word. We actually want to negotiate what is on the table for us to negotiate and be really clear what's on there. Because if this is consulting, we are tired of it. I'm tired of hearing my own voice. You know, the whole thing that James talked about 20 years ago, how much more consultation, the, the problems haven't changed. We have got solutions. So when I talk about what are the activities, and so I work um, at the Molly Wadaguga Research Centre and it's named in legacy of a Barada woman who comes from Managarita of, of um, Northwest uh, East Arnhem. And she had a very clear vision, which was getting women, instead of going to Gove and Darwin Hospital, to actually birth on community as their connection to land, their cultural connection to land, cultural practices. But she also grew up in um, the leprosarium and she was trained as Aboriginal health worker in the 60s. So yeah, she'd, a, a, a white doctor had worked with her. So she had seen this Western system and she'd gone back to her community and thought, how do these systems come back together? Yet we need white clinicians, but the core knowledges of Aboriginal and Torres Strait, uh, Aboriginal young women was actually taken out of the care processes. So our, our research centre was named in her legacy because we know when Aboriginal women can birth in a place, in a framework with things wrapped around them in integrated care that's defined by them as being safe, we're going to get better outcomes. So we, um, James and Cleveland have mentioned the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health and Brisbane Aches, which is a I think they're celebrating 45 years this year, 45 years as being based in Brisbane. Um, and so we worked with them and Marta Hospital. And we were the, you know, again, for me, research is I'm only a storyteller. I'm not the clinician doing the work. I'm not the health worker doing the work. And we could tell this amazing story when these three organisations, so the Marta births 10,000 babies a year, the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health and Brisbane Aches, 
they have got connection to the community. They've got this integrated care. Their core business is about Aboriginal hands for Aboriginal people, the way we want to do it. Yeah, so what we found that after a period of time, we saw a reduction of preterm births by almost 39% when these organisations came together. And the CEOs of those organisations came and had a governance model that says, we're in this together. Nobody was the one boss. And so you had a workforce model that talked to each other. And there were lots of pointy elbows. You had midwives and obs and gynies saying, no, no, these are my women. And then you had the community control sector. Hey, actually, we need to wrap our arms around this. So we saw a reduction of preterm births in, in South East Queensland. We saw, saw a reduction of child removal at birth go down. So what we saw was this new model of care, birthing in our community, actually was a protective factor. We also reported that we saved the system money. So the stuff of, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cost too much money. Actually, when we look at the community control sector, they actually save you money. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the big money spenders, it's not this sector. And when we talk about intergenerational um, thriving and flourishing and things like that, our sector, our communities are worrying about the kids that are yet to come. So I have a, a beautiful eight-month-old granny. So when I talk about what does um, you know, uh, intergenerational wealth and flourishing look like, I'm thinking, what's her grandchildren going to look like? It's just not a plot on things. So those numbers mean a lot. So when you have that, the next part is, so it's about who's at the table. What are we defining as the problem? Yeah, so when we talk about equity, it's a value statement. Who dominates that value? And where does the equity you go? Know, at the end of the day, the health system is a conduit for overcrowding, poverty. We're never going to be able to deal with that. You know, which, which clinician turned around, yep, I'm going to stop you being poor. It's not going to happen. I'm going to build you a house. So until we look at these issues at a broader spectrum, and then people, you know, going on Chelsea's point of people think, I'm a good clinician. I wouldn't want to hurt anybody. But we work in a system that is systemically and structurally harming us. We are part of that system. And therefore, I have to take responsibility for that. So whether I see my colleagues, you know, thinking, oh, you know, that black person that's a diabetic. Well, actually, it's Mrs. Jones, who's 60, who has this family. She's not the black diabetic. She's a human. Where's our humility and humanity? So we need to look at these systems, what they do. So one of the things I'm really, what we've done in, in, in our birthing, on, birthing in our community here is we are dismantling a system and actually putting the aspirations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander to redesign it. Because if we just do the black cladding, which is I'm going to put up Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag here, we're going to put a mural there, we're going to have a couple of health workers, that's the gammon stuff. We need to look at this system and realise we need to unpack it Look at the institutional races a minute, the systemic stuff that we all give a green flag to pretend because it's a little bit too hard. So when we unpack it and dis dis uh, dismantle it and then we build something together that actually privileges our knowledge because it's valued and also it offers solutions, we get different and better results. Mm. So birthing in our community, um, you know, South East Queensland is, is the model that the rest of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander saying we can do this if we're, give, we're at the table and we can have this conversation. So that's something, you know, South East Queensland, are you in and Brisbane? Eight? So I bet your, your, um, your illustration here is showing that uh, there are local solutions to these systemic problems. I might use that as a cheeky segue to go to Greg, because um, Greg, I know you've been doing a clinical yarning project uh, in, in hospital health systems where there has been a history of um, deafness, I guess, for people coming through the system. Do you want to just tell us and share a bit about what you learned from that process? Um, well, I guess sort of segueing and, and reinforcing, you know, the, the things that people have mentioned today, I think it's um, that the core of it is responsibility and accountability and uh, for the system and the people who work in that system to actually avail opportunities for the under, um, you know, uh, well, I would say underprivileged in terms of being in that system and having voice and power to actually have a say about things. The most uh, important sort of indicator in terms of change is whether it makes people feel uncomfortable. If you're comfortable, you're not going to commit to change. 
So one of the big things that I, I sort of, you know, am very sort of uh, passionate about is the idea of making people feel uncomfortable. Because it's only when you feel, and David can attest to this, having supervised me for many years. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm a big believer in challenging our own sort of internal processes, logic, you know, narratives that we create and actually feeling okay with the idea of some level of dissonance, of some level of discomfort. That's what enables change because that's what drives us from a position where we might be in now to a position that we say we want to be in. So unless you're uncomfortable, I would suggest you're not committed to this process. So with respect to the um, the idea, and I completely agree with it, uh, the idea of, you know, um, uh, interventions. Um, a lot of the time they're interventions on us with a, with a sort of a, an idea that we are the problem. We are the weakness. You know, we need to be uh, solved. How much research over how many years, decades, um, has been done on our people at the detriment of our people for the benefit of other people off the back of black blood. And I'll say it, it may, may, may make you feel uncomfortable when I say that. Good. Uh, the, the thing I would say, so the, the project that you're talking about, Dave, one of the projects we had the privilege to sort of work up with the hospital and health service sector um, was a project looking at an intervention um, in the mental health space. So the public hospital and health service mental health space. When I say intervention, the reason I'm comfortable saying intervention, it's an intervention on non-Indigenous clinicians. And it's about training them to be better communicators and respectful of our people. So, and it's informed by conversations with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workers, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander consumers. So this is sort of flipping it on its head a little bit and saying, actually, maybe the intervention doesn't need to happen at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander target level. It needs to happen at a systemic level. Maybe what we need to do is come up with an intervention that actually changes the way the system does things uh, and uh, change some of that narrative, some of that logic. Um, and, you know, so we're working on that. I think it, it was one of the largest ideas grants award in 2022. Um, and I'm very privileged to be able to work with our people, our consumers, our communities, and the public hospital and health service. And I will say also clinicians, non-Indigenous principally clinicians, to be able to start to explore some of those some of those uh, those needs from a communication behaviour perspective and how we intervene with clinicians to improve that behaviour. Uh, so I will say on the on the consultation and engagement level from a community perspective. I am continue to be and will always be an advocate for community driven research, not researcher driven research. I'm tired of seeing proposals develop autonomously by a well meaning, you know, researcher. Always well meaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not always, maybe. <laughs> Maybe there's a little bit of self-interest there and that I, I get to have my, my salary for a little bit longer and that very esteemed bandwidth or whatever it is, but, um, you know, uh, developed autonomously without involving the intended beneficiary. If things are going to make a difference, they need to involve us. We need to be, you know, at the table and we need to inform that process and we need to co-design that. More than that, we actually need to lead that conversation. And that's where humility comes in from a research, health and medical sector perspective. Being humble enough to say, I don't have the expertise necessarily to drive or to lead or to inform or to develop or to propose a solution. And I want to do it with people who do. And I recognise that in my own limitation, which is a very difficult thing to pe for people to do, recognise their own limitations, where their expertise starts and stops, and then go and seek out the expertise that maybe you don't have. And if you're recognising that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, the health service sector, the policy sector, you know, academia, um, you know, have that expertise, then, you know, looking, working with and asking for permission to come in and have a conversation about that potential need and what that need might be, and then develop solutions to address that need that actually privilege both parties and benefit both parties, not just pay for a research fellow in an academic institution, working in isolation in a very prestigious university or other space, you know, but rather shared benefit. And I mean this way too, money way, 
Um, so, so Greg, people... I might stop there because I realised I was operating off Yvette's clock and she's at oh. Darwin time. So they, <laughs> they're actually half an hour ahead of what we thought. So I realised time is, is drawing to a close. I don't mean to be rude, but I, I did want to move on. I, I wanted to avoid, uh, if we could, uh, discussing elections and things like that because I oh, there's just a lot going on. But looking beyond this weekend, can I ask you each um, whether you think uh, there is grounds for optimism moving forwards. Can, can we see a better place or is there still a lot of pessimism? So I know it's a loaded kind of a question and a bit heavy to end a discussion, but maybe I'll start with Cleveland uh, and work our way backwards along the panel here. But Cleveland, what, what are your feelings for the future? Have you got hope? I, I think regardless of what the outcome is on the weekend, there's going to be pain and grief with the, either way it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, I think from our point of view, it's just we're going to continue to do what we do now. So can I just ask you there, if yes wins, you think there'll still be pain and grief? Uh, well, yeah, because not everyone, you know, was in sort of agreement with the yep. yes vote. Same that, you know, if it's a no, that the people that voted yes are also going to be pain and grief there too. Yeah. And I think our challenge then is to take stock and then continue to do what we're doing now, you know, getting our voices heard, uh, making sure that we're changing the system to cater for the specific needs of our, our mob across Queensland. It's going to be a lot of work. I think it is going to set relationships back. And we've seen now, you know, similar to the US where, you know, the, the racists and the idiots have come out after what's happened with Trump. I think that could happen here. It's probably starting to see, you know, start of that happening. If it's a no vote, I think that's going to be ramped up. Um, we're seeing a lot of racism, as James said, now against our mob, even even amongst our own mob. You know, I mean, it's hard enough fighting, you know, government and people outside when you've got to fight your own mob at the same time. So I think either way, there's going to be grief. We're going to have to take stock and then map out how we go forward from here. Okay, thank you. Greg? I, I think... I'll turn that on. Maybe. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Regardless of the outcome, there are going to be people who are hurt, but at the same time, hurt is an opportunity for catharsis and healing. And I would say, you know, um, uh, we do need to, and we've, you know, moved to a space of healing as well, um, you know, there's an opportunity here for people to have a voice to be able to actually, you know, be involved in defining that healing journey, you know, for themselves where, you know, and I think, you know, we, we need to recognize that as well. And um, it's important that everybody has a voice to be able to share their opinion, to feel safe, to be able to share their opinion on topics, you know, that are relevant to them and to influence and inform decisions, you know. Um, so I think at the end of the day, regardless of the outcome, we need to be conscious of who we avail the opportunity to sit at a table and inform the decisions that are made purportedly for the benefit of all and in particular where they're relevant and where they're a priority and where there are particular concerns to priority groups like my people's. Look, I have an interesting relationship with hope um, and I think there's um, hope has been very much a part of this campaign um, and a vesting of hope in settlers to grant this body, a body that has no power, a body that, according to Clause 3, means that the government of the day gets to decide its membership, composition, function, everything. So settlers still have control over whatever voice is, is in place. Um, and it will be telling if no gets up about the nature of race relationships in this place, that even when still holding all the power, 97, you know, majority of Australians say, no, blackfellas don't even deserve that. Mm -hmm. um, and what concerns me here is, is hope as a strategy is a form of violence for us as, as blackfellas, hope in settler colonial institutions. Um, and I worry for the mob who have invested their hope in um, the generosity of settlers to grant this who have been betrayed by in this current moment um, because that's the same um, 
I've seen it so many times of the people who come to me um, at the point of racial complaint who have laboured for an institution, whether it's in police, health, wherever, um, who've laboured in the hopes of improving things for our people and put up with violence in their institutions in the hope of achieving better for our people. And so withstood it and have reached the point of betrayal um, and, and, and breaking the silence and speaking up and taking action on it. And so my concern is for mob at the end of the day, um, October 15th, as it has been before that. Um, and I'm hopeful that maybe we might strategize differently should, should no um, uh, arrive on the 15th of October, that we might think differently about how we undermine the ongoing violence of settler colonialism in this place, for which race has been the foundational vehicle of. Um, so I'm optimistic that maybe when we wake up on October 15th, that we could then be honest about where we're at as a country honest about that because the campaign has relied on a mythologizing of who we are as a nation in order to secure the most conservative of Australians to agree to this. Now, if this doesn't get up, surely now we can tell the truth about racial violence and the nature of race relations. Thank you. Yvette? Yeah, look, I mean, um, being a, a black sovereign woman in this country, you wake up every day with the idea of hope. Otherwise, if otherwise, there's no point getting up because the structure actually it doesn't want you to be successful and you're going to fight every day as a battle. So hope, aspirations, where we're going is part of our DNA, otherwise we would not be here. We are clever people. Whatever happens on you know, Saturday night, Sunday, Monday, there will be grief and mourning in our communities for a whole range of things. This is, you know, if you guys think this has been hard for you guys to listen to, imagine being this every day. You know, I've, I've had non-Indigenous people say, wow, this is really heavy. I said, yeah, actually, you don't, you don't get the side eye. You don't get the Texas that says, if I saw you down the street, you know, you know, I, I'd happily uh, run you over. Or, you know, as a black woman, you should be raped because you believe in this. You know, people who think this is okay. So every day when I think about, like I talked about my granddaughter, I think I have a responsibility from the elders and the people who have fought for me to get this opportunity to take that responsibility forward. So I'm the beneficiary of people who marched the streets in the 70s to get us into education, to get us into universities, to get me a, a PhD scholarship who's opened the doors to get me where I am. And I have a responsibility to have a strong back so people can climb on my shoulders to go forward. And whatever happens on Saturday night is only a step going forward. And it might be, for my, my generation, there might not be any change. But for my granddaughter's generation, I want the landscape to look very different for her. I want for her to think, my grannies can do everything and anything, you know, and I don't want her to hold her breath every day. Oh, I hope they could be good to us. I hope they give us this opportunity. I want them to say, so I have a right to be here and my non-Indigenous colleagues sit standing next to me is my ally in this and they're going to be able to have pointy elbows to have that space. Um, you know, if no gets up tomorrow, guess what? It's the people who pushed for yes, they'll be picking up the crumbs. The no people will move on. Can I just say as a black known person, yep. no, we'll be getting up too. Yeah. So, um, it's just a different strategy yeah, and, good ways. And I, and I think that's the, the stuff of at the end of the day, we sit here as 3% of this population asking for you to do something for us again. And that is when you talk about equity, that's the most unequitable thing that we have to come cap in hand asking for our rights to be at the table. So, again, equity is a moral question, who's asking it and who's defining it. Given the, those eloquent uh, closing statements and looking at the time in Brisbane, not in Darwin, I can see that we've reached our time limit. So I'm sorry if I ignored your questions or didn't see them, but I'm sure our panellists would be happy to uh, converse with you over a cup of coffee shortly. So can you please join with me thanking very profusely our panellists, Cleveland, Greg, Chelsea and Yvette. Thank you so much.